am going to introduce you people according to how I see you on my screen. And I'm going to start up in the left. I'm going to start the bottom this time. Mr. Jim Shepard, if you would, please. Good morning. I'm Jim Shepard, northeast side of Indianapolis. I am a retired CBN me member. Um, been active in the group for 30 something years and uh, just enjoying retirement this time and uh, rain this morning, a day off from golf. So I'm here. I knew you were going to dig us. I knew you were going to dig us. Like you're only joined because you couldn't play golf. You know that. And I know that. No problem. Gloria, please. Okay. Amen. How about now? All yeah, right. much better. <laughs> Thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. Gloria Thomas with Secret. I am your secret agent. We help people look better, feel better, and experience the world through Minerals from the Dead Sea, um, clean nutrition, and world-class experiences. All right. That was nice and short. <laughs> Mr. Nick Sullivan, please. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nick Sullivan, Sullivan Business uh, Solutions here in Raleigh, North Carolina, across the nation. Uh, perform uh, cost remediation and tax uh, mitigation for uh, businesses, as well as legal and identity theft services from uh, Legal Shield. Uh, if you know a company owns a building or hires employees or designs or improves processes, they might be eligible for significant dollars back into uh, the businesses through uh, tax credits. Again, it's Nick Sullivan, Sullivan uh, Business Solutions, protecting your business and your bottom line. Thank you so much, Nick. Rhoda Israeloff. Good morning and hello, Lynn. I'm so happy you were able to join us and I hope we'll be able to see your face here soon. Um, I'm in Indianapolis, Indiana, and um, I'm gonna correct Jim Shepard by saying that I joined this group, CBN, in um, 1982. And wow. Jim was already there. <laughs> he was already a veteran member. So, are, you, are you trying to say Jim is old? What are uh, you doing? Not at all. Only that he's uh, more of a veteran even than I and that this group is a very, very uh, well history group. And it's very special in my life. And I apparently also in yours, Jim, if you're still with us, that's great. Um, <laughs> So um, my, my team and I write what you read when you go on our clients' websites. And we are looking right now for a temporary assignment, which means a business that's affecting some sort of new offering or new change in their way of doing business. And they want to tell the world about it in the form of a blog, but that blog may not last for years. So we have clients that are, they're going into the 13th year of blogging, but they may want to do just six months worth of blogging just to get a, this very uh, immediate message across. So if you find someone that's looking to promote something new about their business, please refer them to us and we will say it for you. Thank you, Rhoda. Mr. Mr. David Garrison. Good morning. I'm Dave Garrison with Mutual of Omaha Mortgage. I work with wealth advisors, financial advisors, real estate agents, and their clients to use their housing wealth to achieve their retirement goals. Thank you, David. Mr. Mike Chambers. Good morning, all. I'm Mike Chambers, um, longtime CBN member um, here on the north side of Indianapolis. Um, just want to uh, let everybody know that Jim Shepard joined when he was 12 years old. So, uh, you know, <laughs> anyway, um, but I'm a retired independent insurance agent here in town. Thank you, Jim. You shouldn't have, you should have played golf, buddy. Today is pick on Jim day. Rhoda's, <laughs> Rhoda's making you old and other ones making you a baby. I, I don't know. I got nothing. Like, you know, we're not, this is not the Jay Leno show. We're, we're, we're good. We're good, though. We're good. <clears throat> hey, with that, uh, what I want to do is, uh, Lynn, obviously, we haven't worked out the logistics on you showing no. yourself yet. So that's no problem, really. 
Uh, if you guys want to see a picture of Lynn, hey, it was in the email. You can go take a, <laughs> you can come and see a picture of him. Uh, no problem. <clears throat> but Lynn, you are capable of uh, sharing your screen. And so what I'd like to do is go ahead and allow you to uh, have the Lynn Karazi uh, show. And you can screen share. You've got control of that. And then uh, what I'd like to do is make sure we get plenty of time for questions. So with that, Lynn, you're in charge. Sure. Hey, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to, to chat with you guys for a little bit this morning. And uh, Rhoda and I met, this was back in January or February, and um, got this all set up and really looking forward to sharing something. Hopefully there's some takeaways here that y'all can, can use within your business. And today we're going to be talking about really how you manage and manage your business, particularly with your financial statements and your numbers. And so to get an idea of who's in the audience here and what you think about these things, when you think about looking forward to your numbers and finances, which one of these are you? So are you a number one? You really love this kind of stuff. You really dig in. Number two, there's some surprises that I need to do. Number three, this is just making me frustrated. Number four, makes you want to scream. Are you a one, two, three, or four? Who's the ones? What if you're all of them? What's that? What if you're all of them? If you're all of them, then that means you run the whole spectrum where, you know, there's this stuff that you realize you have to do, but you really may not want to, which I think is what the situation with a lot of business and Gloria's there shaking her head. I know I got to do this. I don't like it. Okay, so let's take a let's let's take another another crack at this. I use my financial statements to start campfires, keep my table from wobbling, or manage and control my numbers. Hopefully, we all say three. But I actually have heard, I've I've had a small business owner admit to me that yep, I I have a stack of paper underneath my desk that I never look at. And part of it does keep my table from wobbling. So that is actually a, a true, true story. And so when we get to the heart of this, what I wanna talk about today is being financially confident. Just scribble down on a sheet of paper right now, if you've got one in front of you, what do the words financially confident mean to you? And then based on your own definition on a scale of one to 10 with one being low, 10 being high, how, do you, how financially confident do you feel about running your business? Give you just a second to do that, and then we'll jump right in. Everyone got there with some thoughts down? Okay, so there's three things that I want people to walk away with today. And these are, as I, as I look at business world, and I started my career with Procter & Gamble, was a finance and accounting manager with them for years and years and years, worked in, in manufacturing facilities, worked with brands, worked with supply chain, did an overseas stint with them, uh, managing a brand on a global basis. And there's three things that I want people to take away today that I've learned. There's no one, not a single person who's ever gonna care more about your financial results than you do. And I think everyone can accept that. We don't always act in that manner. Second truth is that you must have both an accounting and a finance view of your business. And people say, well, what's the difference between finance and accounting? That's where we're gonna spend a good chunk of our time because they are separate disciplines. And number three, and this is what it still boggles my mind that so many business owners from the solopreneur all the way up to people running three, four million, five million, fifty million dollar companies, numbers are information, information is profit. So all those numbers that are collecting in all your different spreadsheets, accounting systems, all the reports that you generate, that's all data, that's all the assets that you but most business owners don't think of as assets, but those things can actually be used to tell you a lot more about your business than you ever thought possible. And that better information can help you generate more profit for your business. So we're gonna take each one of these um, kind of in a, you know, in, a quick, in a quick manner and walk through and if you have questions along the way, don't handle, you know, don't wait until the end. You know, I think we got plenty of time to answer them as we go. So I'm gonna jump right in with, um, with why are we talking about this? You know, most startups don't fail because they're not profitable or they're not great ideas or you're not doing the right things. But this is a study that's done every year by SCORE, the Service Corps of Retired Executives. And they determine that 82% of business failures are because you run out of cash. 
And running out of cash is something that you can be able to see it if you're actually looking out with your organization a little bit more. If you're just looking at my, my results today, this is where your problems are. There's a lot of times that, because you do have an opportunity to, re, you know, to react to what's coming if you're aware of what, is, of what is coming. So this is the context. You know, businesses are profitable. They just don't have the cash flow. And so jumping right in, when we talk about no one cares more about you, there's some great candidates and some great business partners that are very much involved with your finances, specifically your accountant or your bookkeeper. And most of the, the most of the time, this is the people that a business owner is going to turn to and say, help me out, help me manage this part, this particular part of my operation. But recognize their roles. Uh, a couple of months ago, I had a conversation with a banker and this husband and wife team came to him and said, hey, we'd like to borrow roughly a quarter of a million dollars to redo our store and generally um, you know, upgrade our business in a lot of different ways. He said, yeah, this is what we can do. You know, this is what we do. So send me your financials and we'll take a look and see how it goes. He said, I had to call them back two weeks later and tell them, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. And the woman said, you know, why not? We're profitable. We're, we've been making money for years and years and years. And the, the banker said, I'm sorry, but you know, your, your sales have gone down every quarter for the past two years. And the woman looks at him and says, that can't be right. Our accountant is our best friend. He's our neighbor. Well, he may be your accountant, he may be your friend, he may be your neighbor, not always your financial advisor. Why? They're reporting what, what's happening, not telling you what you should be doing about it or putting those, the results on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis in context. If you have a business coach, they will always tell you, you need to look at this, you need to look at this. And a lot of people gave them, you know, they'll collect, you know, they'll give them cash flow forecasting tools. But unfortunately, they never really tell them how to use them. I worked with a small um, small business owner here in the Milwaukee area where I'm from, and she was a solopreneur, has had a business for the past four years, and she's gone through two business coaches and three accountants in that time period. They all tell her, do the cash flow forecast, and she showed me the spreadsheets that were given them. One was so simplistic, it would never, you know, it, it would never be able to do what it's supposed to do. And the second one was so complex that with no instruction, she was never gonna figure it out. We were actually then worked with her to develop a tool that would enable her to forecast her cash flow as well as her profits and give her some more information about her business. You know, bankers, they care about your finances, right? Yeah, as long as you're making your payments. And sorry if someone's in the banking industry here, um, but a lot of times the bankers will call you once a month, have that chat or once a year, have that chat with you about how the last year went Again, just to make sure that they've gotten their, their money covered. And then finally, yeah, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, whoever else you're going to leave your money to, they're obviously going to be interested in it, but they're not going to be involved at all. And so who does that leave? It leaves you. At the end of the day, someone can do the work for you. Your responsibility, your best interest is to make sure you understand exactly what's happening and why, and give yourself plenty of time to figure out what you need to do differently. Make sense, questions or thoughts? Okay. So second of all, accounting versus finance. How many people think that it is the same thing? Have you ever thought yeah. about, anyone talk to you about what's the finances of your business versus the, the banking side of it or the, or the accounting side of it? So when you think about most, most companies, they start with, you know, the, you know you get the idea, I'm going to be a baker of muffins, I'm going to do yard work, I'm going to paint houses. First thing I'm going to do, and a lot of people will coach you on this, is let somebody else handle the book work, because that book work is not making you any money. And so what happens is you end up starting with a bookkeeper. And bookkeeping is the recording of the transactions, building your financial statements. A lot of times they, they do your payroll. Eventually, you take it to an accounting organization, your business gets a little bigger, you're, now you're starting getting into banking, um, banking issues, you need help in managing your receivables, your payables, inventory, you've got more assets that need to be capitalized, you track the depreciation, there's more tax related stuff, and of course the accountant is gonna be the one that files your income taxes. There's deeper financial reporting a lot of times, and they do some business analysis, 
And of course, there's the auditing work. And the good thing about that is that gives you a whole view of your business as to, in terms of what your results are. The finance in this context is not the banking relationships, it's not how you get money to fund your business, but this is that other discipline work of business analysis beyond dollars. How many customers do you have? How many, you know, how many invoice, how many customers are buying one, two, three, or all four of the different product styles that you have? It's forecasting your business, it's the key performance indicators in performance management processes and investment analysis. And so really a lot of the work of the finance person and the easy way to figure out the difference is the accountant is the A stands for actuals, tells you what happened. You know, they can tell you what your sales are. They can tell you by product size. They can tell you by you know, geographies and all the different ways that you set up your accounting to report. The finance person is taking more of a futuristic, where's your business going? Answering the questions, not actually happen, what happened, but why is it happening? And what are you gonna do for it? What are you gonna do about it? And you think about it as the, account, as the accounting group gets bigger, the accountant that you hired eventually becomes your senior accountant, becomes your accounting manager, also then becomes your um, controller, eventually maybe your CFO, or you take on a part-time or full-time CFO. When he starts or she starts getting a bunch more questions than able to answer, first thing they do is hire a finance person. And that's really the difference between smaller companies and bigger companies when it comes to managing the finance and business analysis. It is that finance function that gets built. And unfortunately, a lot of small to medium-sized businesses never get into this type of work because they've, they've been successful without it. They don't appreciate the opportunity cost of, of not using it. Questions about accounting versus finance. Is it something that uh, is a different view for you or something you've been aware of? No, I've, uh, this is Keith Rand. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've always treated that finance function separately. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, because really there's, there's, you, there's three main financial statements that you have. Your income statement, your balance sheet, the source of use of cash. And the big question about each one of them is, why are the results what they are? Again, the, 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 fun, the function of accounting tells you, you know, what your results are, understanding and figuring out why. And just if, as a quick refresher, people probably know this, income statements, that's your profits earned during, during a defined period. Gross margin is the key business, business measure. The one thing that a, an income statement does, unless you're truly on a cash basis, it doesn't represent really the physicality of what your business is doing. It's not telling you how many customers you're selling to, you know, whether your business is growing or not. If you can trend it all over time, you get some of that stuff. And the key margins, I've worked with a lot of small business owners. Their, their books are not even set up to give them a gross margin by customer, by product line, which is one of the key measures and one of the first things I do and look at in working with a small business owner is, do you have the information even available and set up to be able to tell you what you need to know? The balance sheet, it's again, it's that snapshot on any given day or month end of your assets, liabilities, and the equity. What's the net worth of your business? Assets are those things that have value. Liabilities are what you know. Equities, that, that, that's, the, that's the value that really is yours. And then ultimately the source and use of cash, getting an understanding is where's your cash coming in and where's it going out? And receivables and payables management are the two really big things in there. And a lot of people, they, you know, they don't want to bother their customers or afraid of it upsetting them if they ask them for, for their money. And I mean, yeah, Rhoda's shaking her head. She's seen that before. And it's kind of like, wait a minute, why can you not afford to pay me, you know, in 120 days? And typically, you know, you get up to 90 before anyone really starts worrying about it. But really understanding your cash flow, not only what's happened, but also then what's, you know, what are the next couple months look ahead? And if you're projecting that, which again is more that finance function, if you're projecting that, you can kind of see on a decent basis about where you're headed. So you have time to respond and react to it. And so at the end of the day, which, is, which wins, profit or cash flow? You know, I would submit that on it, you know, no matter how you slice it, cash flow wins because you cannot put profit in a bank. You're actually putting the leftover cash and the profit has all these other 
you know, accounting related transactions to it, depreciation, things like that that influence profit. But at the end of the day, you have to have cash flow. So, you know, looking at it, the profit is what's left over from sales after all expenses have been accounted for. And, you know, the difference between an accounting, you know, the, the accrual basis versus the cash basis, you know, accounting rules determine all that. Expenses are not really tied to your performance. And a company with a lot of cash can be unprofitable for a really long time. You know, think about the, um, you know, the, the woman is talking about wanted to borrow money, you know, that they were making profit, but they were slowly not making, not generating as much cash. Cash flow tells you, are you creating more value than what you're spending? And so if, you know, again, if you see that you're going to run out of cash, you have the opportunity to take on debt or sell some ownership. And there's ways of generating cash to fund future growth. And so again, lots of options that a lot of small business owners don't often you know, truly think about. And so at the end of the day, the real value of finance is that future focus, cash flow and profit forecasting. Um, you know, I, that's what I, when I started with my career with Procter and Gamble, uh, I, I did a, sign, a stint as a, as a profit forecaster. And it's kind of cool because you do get that whole view of the business. What's going on? You're working with the general manager, the brand manager. You're working with the all the different functions, the marketing people, the, the manufacturing people. You're really understanding what's the business thinking about? What's my future look like? And right now, when you think about COVID and where we're at now, no one could have seen any kind, anything like COVID on the forecasting standpoint. And plus, the only thing you know about your forecast, it is going to be wrong. It's just a matter of how wrong it's going to be and if you understand why. When you think about a lot of companies who start their budgeting, what's your, what's your, what's your forecast going to be for next year? Well, we're going to plan to be at 5%. Okay, how? If you don't understand how you're getting the results you are, how do you, how do you know what to do differently to give you a different result? I worked with a distributor once. This, this guy was about a $2 million, so not a real big distributor, two, two million in sales. And he said, yeah, I need to, I need to grow my business because I'm running out of capacity in my warehouse. I need to do something different. I have to borrow money to expand. Great. How are you going to grow? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, are you going to go hire another salesperson? Yeah, probably. Or are you going to hire the hunter killer who's going to go out and get new business for you? Or do you have a hunter killer that can you know, you can go do something else. You need somebody that's going to help manage relationships. Or would you be better off uh, hiring two inside sales reps instead of going out and hiring another person who's going to be out in the road accumulating other expenses? Can an inside salesperson work for you? That's the cash flow and profit forecasting piece. The increased financial analysis. This is the scenario planning and really digging in. You know, how are you growing your business? Are you getting more customers? keeping those customers, selling more to the, of the same products to them, or selling a greater variety. There's not an accounting system that I know of that really does that, torp, that type of source of sales use. And then once you understand who your customers are, what, how they're behaving, you tap into the cost of the sales, and all of a sudden now you've got a completely different way of looking at gross margins too. And so it's, again, it's trying to answer that question, why am I getting the results? And then the finance and accounting, the finance person is going to be more getting into those non-cash measures. They're going to work not only with the dollars and cents, yes, that's what they do, but what are the other key things that are, you know, are, are really driving your business? Is it the number of orders you're shipping out, average order size? These are the type of things that a lot of times an accounting person is just not going to get to in the same way that a finance person would. And so I tried to start out with three truths for the day. No one, not a single person will care more about your finances. We talked a little bit about, you must have this accounting and, and the finance advisor. And numbers are important and that information is profit. So what does this all mean? At the end of the day, come back to that first question I asked, are you financially confident? And so what are the thoughts that some people had when you heard, saw the words financially confidence? What were you thinking about? Anyone to share what their thoughts were? Okay. Okay. And, well, and then on a scale of one to 10, how many people were above a five? Okay. Financially confident, there's three ways that I think about this is, you can explain two years of your financial performance to anybody. 
that's not only what it is, but why it is. And so, and if you can talk about the why that it is, you deeply understand your business and you know what's actually driving it. You have a plan for what, you know, you have a plan for what you can look for three to six months ahead. This is that forecasting piece. So yes, I'm confident that I'm not going to run out of cash two, three, four, five months from now. I have a plan to turn around the sales um, shortfall that I've had in the first quarter of the year. I know what I'm going to be doing differently and I have a way of measuring the results of my actions. And then it kind of, this kind of lets into it, you have a reasonable longer term forecast so if you understand what's going to happen in the next three to six months, you begin taking that out a little bit further. Now you're getting into a continual planning cycle. You know what's coming ahead. So if you have all three of those things, you are not only financially confident, you are funding ready. And when you're funding ready, these are the things that your banker is going to want to know. So if you go to say, okay, what's going on with your, with your finances? And you say, I don't know. I have to ask, you know, let me get back to you on that. Not as confident, not as good, you know, not a good response for, for a banker. Can you pay the loan? You know, if you can present a plan that gives them the confidence, have the confidence in you, they're going to look more favorably upon you. So this is what I mean. Are you financially confident? If you are, then you're going to be funding ready which is another great thing for you to be thinking about as a small business owner, because now you have a plan for which you can continue to grow. So that's what I've got for today. I wanna to thank you all for the, for the time. My contact information is here. And I, again, I really apologize for not being able to, to, to talk to you live and in person. Of course I'm live, but not being able to see, it's discouraging because again, I, I live on Zoom like everybody else does these days. Any kind of questions that, that folks might have? Hey, Lynn, can you return a screen to me, please? I sure can. Two, two quick questions, Lynn. Uh, and I, I made this comment because I lived it for a while until I got a little smarter. Most small businesses, we plan for it today. Yes. <laughs> this, you know, these things that you're talking about now, I probably didn't learn them until I've been in business 13, 14 years, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Yeah. And, and, and so this, and, and these, uh, these terms like KPI, you know, I don't, how many of you guys raise your hand if you know what KPI means? Yeah. So like, which means key performance indicators. It, I don't know if most small business even think conceptually like that. How do you get single entrepreneurs and small businesses to understand? Because I didn't, I'm going to be honest with yeah. you, until, you know, until I was well into my uh, career and I started buying things. And now, you know, I'm looking at like, mm -mm, I need to know your KPIs. I need to know this, that, and the other. How do we get small businesses smarter? You know, a lot of it is, you know, it's, it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact with folks. Um, because all, there's a lot of good information that's out there. But again, we're so busy working on the today. And we, you know, and everyone tells you, you need to take time to work on your business instead of in it. A lot of this stuff is, it's the working on the piece, you know, and, and just trying to convince small business owners, you need to spend a day a month, actually just kind of taking time away and looking at what's, you know, what's going on with your, what's going on with your business, what's working and not working. Because again, if you don't have a good understanding of, you know, of how you're working today, which, what of your activities are driving your business, you don't know what to change differently. And one of the things I really, that really struck me that I learned this from Procter & Gamble, the only thing that finance and accounting do, they assign a value to your activities. And so what activities are you physically doing that are going to make money for your business? I know it's hard. You know, I spend way more time than I probably should thinking about admin type stuff. They're not making me stuff. So now I, I kind of track how much of my time do I spend doing this non-valuated stuff? And yes, I've just you know, given myself license to go out and hire a virtual assistant to do those things. Yeah, great question. I was actually, there's, a, there's an organization, uh, you guys may or may not have heard of it. It's called the Turnaround Management Association. And TMA, the global organization, and it's, it is almost entirely made up of people who provide services to businesses 
that are really on the rocks. They really need to be turned around. And I was on a call two weeks ago with, it was a TMA call and I was describing what I do. And I do more of the, the business analytics for small to medium sized companies. And I said, how do, you, how do you get people to do this? Because even in our, even in our business, we see so much of it is, um, it's complacency is the biggest thing that and habit that prevents them from doing what they need to do, which ends up they have to eventually somebody drives them to us. They don't come to TMA, a TMA member voluntarily. It's like they are almost always told to do something. So I don't have. I wish I had the better answer for you, um, but you know. But that's part of what as I've gone from big companies to smaller to smaller to smaller to smaller, I see the need. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I started Data to Profit two and a half years ago to bring some of this wisdom, knowledge, and to try to convince people there is a better way to, for you to be, more, to be more successful than you are. But you can also do it a lot with, you know, with a lot more information than you're currently thinks even available to you. You're muted, Rhoda. I know. Okay. Um, Lynn, it occurs to me from a marketer standpoint, that the people that need to hear what you just now said are the accountants because all these businesses have accountants mm -hmm. and bookkeepers that, that they may not have the uh, finance person but they have the accounting person and the bookkeeping you know and or the bookkeeping person so yes. they, they are going to be the ones that are going to have to speak up and say hey you know John, you're just going to have to do this. We, we need to add this piece here. And somehow they need to be incented to do that. Yeah, I've, I've actually, um, and th thanks for the, the question and comment. I, I've, I've tried to do that a bit. I've done a lot of outreach to accountants and bookkeepers. I'll go on their website and say, you do all this kind of stuff as a complimentary service, not a competitive service. You know, I'd love to partner with you. And it's just amazing. They see their they see their business as their business, and I haven't found many of them who yeah. want to think out of that box and offer that different service. Right. Or and actually, you know, you want to have some fun. Go to a networking event and ask a bookkeeper what they think about accountants, and ask accountants what they think about bookkeepers. Right. <laughs> because it's really easy to get a QuickBook license and say I'm a bookkeeper. But to be able to set it up in a way and have the conversation with the person, and there's some really great bookkeepers and some really great accountants out there that do a lot of this stuff. But I was I would submit that they are the minority and not the majority of the people before providing those services. Yeah. Even the I'm in the process of switching my accounting service because I tried to have this conversation with them and I'm their client. Hey, I want to help other clients. Yeah. This is well, we, we do we do tax and audit. Why would we want why would we want to do that? And a lot of actually the the, the term finan um, um, funding ready that's that was a term that was introduced to me by a banker. She was she was listening and saying, well, what do you do? Yeah, you get people funding ready, because bankers spend a tremendous amount of, of their time having to rework applications that are submitted. And can you clarify this? Well, give me a little more information, you know. And and they said, yeah, our life would be a lot easier. If people came in, could submit their loan application completely and correctly and, and with all the detail that we need the first time, not the second or the third or the fourth. Yeah, it's funny because in financial, in my financial planning uh, part of my career history, it was the same thing with accountants because they saw that if I, you know, gave them too many questions to answer, that wasn't going to put money in their pockets. And so many accountants started doing selling mutual funds, you know, and getting licensed to, to do things in competition with us. They didn't find a way that it could add to, to what they did. Yes. And so it's the same challenge that I see with you from a marketing standpoint that you you've almost got to go through that barrier of the of the uh, bookkeepers and accountants. Because yes. otherwise, a small business owner isn't going to do it. Yes, and, and and if I can, you know, if I can bring on, like, I've got a couple that are very interested in working with me, and um, it's just a matter of finding the right right clients. Because then the clients just look at this and say, "Well, you know, why aren't you doing this for me?" 
And so, so I even say, look, if, if you're if you're Karen's bookkeeping company, you know, introduce me as part of Karen Bookkeeping Company. I'm, you know, and I, I don't the, the, we can range, you know, who you know, I'm going to provide the services. How the customer sees it is completely up to you. So yeah, so yeah, I'm Rhoda. I'd like to add that 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 a part of this is just a lot of small business owners, and I, same with me. You're just not sophisticated enough to understand this ancillary service and what it can do for you. Mm -hmm. You just don't get it. You're paying an accountant, or you're paying an accountant and a bookkeeper, and now here comes another fee <laughs> on top of that. Yes, and. You know, one of the things that Lynn talked about is cash. Cash is king. So I'm burning through these uh, services that don't make me money. And you just added another layer. Uh, and and I, I can tell you, the more sophisticated the financial organization is, you know, myself and David talk about buying and selling businesses. I can tell you right now, that group of people, they're paying for accountants. They're paying for lawyers. Mm -hmm. They're paying for people uh, like Lynn. They have every sophisticated tool that they can bring in because they want to make money. I don't know if all small businesses, I think they want to get by. Maybe I'm crazy. I think they want to get by. Yeah. And, well, really what you're talking about, I mean, it, and now you're really stretching what is a small business. You know, I've worked with startup nonprofits to, um, you know, to, $50 million businesses. And, uh, you know, and I actually worked, you know, worked with a home builder, a very, very large home builder down in Dallas once. They built 600 homes a year. They were missing their cash flow forecast. They couldn't, under, they couldn't understand why their profits were not going up as fast as the rate of their home sales were. I told them stuff about their business that they, they, they just had hints of. It was kind of in their tummy, but I quantified a lot of stuff for them. And even then it's like, well, you know, we can't do this on a regular basis. We just don't mm -hmm. have the people putting in the right data. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you can't do it, if you can't get people to do this, there's nothing that I nor any other consultant is going to be able to help you with. You have to decide you want to do it. It really is a mindset thing. Do I want to look at my business in a different way? Um, I'm working with a manufacturer's rep right now. And I've never worked with a manufacturer's rep before, but there are certain things that are just true about businesses. You issue a ton of quotes. Do you know how many of you win? Why do you win the ones you win? How much of the ones that you win are, are you actually winning? If it's a, a $50,000 quote, are you getting all 50 of it or only half of it? You know, how many businesses are, are requesting all these quotes from you and never awarding you any of them? Why do you keep awarding those quotes? And they're like, wow. We, we, you know, we, we now we can go have real, co real conversations with our customers about their business with us, and we've got a better idea of what we need to focus on internally to perhaps get better. So it's it's small isn't just small. Small goes up quite a ways before you start really building this capability, and it starts with that point where you realize you need a CFO. Can they, you know, what CFO is not going to build this, the the databases that I build for companies. And so part of what I do is this small business consulting. And I, you know, it's the financial confidence program is just to kind of educate them with what they can do with their financial statements, done it over a four month period. And the other piece is the large, larger um, business analytics process. And I've, yes, I have been that part-time CFO and controller. So I understand what needs to happen and can introduce businesses to some of this, this stuff as, they've get, as they're growing. Yeah, um, I want to bring in Jerry to this conversation. Is there some way in which a, a new business owner who's never owned a business before could use this kind of service from the get-go? You know, when they first come into owning a business and they haven't been a business owner until now. Well, they definitely should. Um, a lot of... <laughs> Funny enough, when I'm talking to prospective franchisees, a lot of the conversation that I have, and, and I actually um, uh, started my life as a CPA, believe it or not, but uh, I, I talk to them about their pro formas 
and talk to them about understanding the KPIs of the business. Um, you know, it's like, you know, you, you really need to understand like average ticket, the number of clients, you know, the close rates and, you know, kind of the top end of that sales funnel and, and I would say cash flow funnel. Um, a lot of them probably have no idea what the heck I'm talking about, frankly. <laughs> uh, but they, they definitely should. They absolutely positively should. Um, I, and and some, some, of the, some franchises do help with that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I, I would say probably more incidentally, right? Like monitor these things, but don't necessarily train them on the underlying importance of it. You know, I mean, they probably get it eventually, but it's more like, hey, take care of these things, but, but not like, hey, this is what it's going to do for you. Yeah, Jerry, Jer- I, I absolutely agree with, with what you say there, because I'm working with two people right now. Um, one is a, a multi-level um, franchise. The other is a, a flooring franchise. And both of them have this whole array of reports, you know? And so one day I was on a, on a Zoom call with one of them, and we started looking at all these stuff. says, Dave, you got so much information here. It's like, yeah, I know it's there, but I don't know what it means. And, you know, and there's just not that, you know, when I, when I hire people, I ask them, you know, when I, in, in, before starting my own business, working with other companies, and I'd hire them, potential people, and i say, what does professional curiosity mean to you? Because that's really what you have to have. Yes, you know, I can report this big blip, but if you don't have the personal curiosity to go figure out what's causing that blip or, you know, like, or a sudden dip, it's like, you know, yeah, you, you have to want to know these things. And you know, I'd say the advantage of, of you know, perhaps you know, the position that you're in, you can work with people when they're starting and they may not get it, but if we can begin developing habits with them you know, early on, maybe they'll carry it through. Yeah, I'm hoping the two of you will, will stay in, in contact because it sounds like that's a, a real <laughs> good nexus. You know, when someone has not been a business owner at all before, they have no idea about these things. Yeah. They need the guidance right then. It's, yeah, it's, it's really starting out. Yeah, Gloria? Yeah, I think for most of us, as we come into business, I mean, it's like Keith said, you know, you go in and you're doing your day to day, you really don't know what you don't know. So um, you think that you've, you've hired an accountant, You've, you've hired um, a bookkeeper, you've got people um, taking care of all of that kind of thing, and you think that you've done as much as you need to do, but you don't, need, you don't know that you need to do more. So how can you educate business owners? I mean, because it, if you don't know that you need more, you think you've done all you can do, then that's, that's all you're going to do. I just scribbling some notes down. Yeah, that, 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 that is the ultimate challenge. And like, I, um, and like, is everybody here on LinkedIn? Is that, you know, I, I post a lot of stuff out on LinkedIn trying to talk about things like this. You know, like earlier this week, I had a post of you know, like, you know, what's, you know, how many really great, how many really great quotes have you forgotten? And it was like quotes and it had something, you know, a, a real insightful quote. But then the behind that was, here's all these, you know, all these other quote pictures. You know, like of sales quotes, like which, which quotes are you really paying attention to? Which ones do you live by? Well, all these other quote ones. And I'm trying, I'm trying to just do some education, you know, like that on, on LinkedIn, trying to create awareness for, yes, there is a difference between finance and accounting. Yes, you should be doing these other things. And speaking, in, you know, opportunities like this, I love to do podcasts and talk to people. Um, I'm exploring, just trying to get out into, there's a, a new platform out there called Clubhouse. Where you can just start a room and start talking about anything. So I'm trying to do a Clubhouse room and we're going to be talking about small business finance. She's a, a, my, um, my you know, partner in crime on that little venture is she's a part-time CFO. So again, we play in very complimentary spaces. She does the strategy work. I do that detail stuff. 
And a lot of small business people say, well, I don't have enough data to look at. Well, yes, you do. Every single invoice creates a whole lot of data about your customer's behavior. Do they come back? How often do they come back? What's their average order size? Is it going up? Is it going down? These are all things that you can begin to look at. But again, it gets lost in rolling it all up into financial statements unless somebody completely unrolls it or starts at the very bottom with the lowest level of detail and start building a different view. You're not going to know what you don't know. Yeah. And, and, you know, just to top this thing off, because, you know, I'm, I'm going to give a plug here for Jim Shepard. Uh, you know, cash is king. Cash is cash is king. And, and when you're dealing with new businesses like Jerry or my, uh, are you looking at other organizations? So I mean, I'll tell you a little short story. Is once again, Jim Shepard. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I bought Jim's business way back when, you know, he talked me into it. But one of the things I had not been doing was sending out an invoice with the job, right? Net, I, I'm net 30. I'm not doing a really good job of booking my money. And, uh, and so I'm working with Jim on a project. I hadn't bought his company yet. And I see all the invoices going out. And Jim goes, Keith, I don't send out an invoice. I mean, I don't send out a job without asking for my money right now. <clears throat> Light bulb, right? Light bulb moment. And so, you know, when you know, as small business owners, you are so busy fighting the fight, you don't have time to think about a whole lot of stuff. That's not true. You don't take time to think about the small, just a small thing like that. So ever since then, it's like, no, God and me are going to pray. But when that job goes out, that invoice is going with it. Because, uh, you know, if you delayed billing by 35, 40 days, and then the client takes 35, 40 days, you're at 90 days before you get your money. So, you know, those are, you, you talk about KPIs, key performance indicators, cash turnover. How often yeah. do you turn that cash? So, yeah, you know, yeah. just small things like that, small things. Just to add to that, um, I've got a friend that's in the landscaping business, and he invested in the technology where somebody comes out, they want to do a quote. He said he does it right there. And he's got the credit card processor right there. He said he's not only going to get his you know, bill when a job is done, he collects a minimum of 50% of it up front. And so that way he, you know, the, he cuts his risk in half and gets more of that cash even before he's paid anything. But we were talking one day and he said, I think I need to hire another crew. I said, well, have you thought about how much that's going to cost you in terms of a second vehicle, another complete set of tools, all the supplies that go along with it? Are you paying too much in overtime now? Now is now the right time? Do you have a, you know, a forecast that says, I'm going to be able to keep this second crew busy? Oh, I never thought of all that. He was going on what his gut told him that he needed to do. Well, let's, let's sit down and put some dollars and cents to it and, and project out, does it make sense for you to do it now? versus midway through the season you know what and then then you, then you get all kinds of questions of what's the job market like who can hire you know who's available but all these things are not just financial questions they are operational questions again that's the physicality of your business that turns that ends up being measured by finance and accounting you mute to, su to support yeah to support what Keith said about cash is king when i when i started in the family business back in 1981 my father-in-law had just died. He had been sick with cancer for the prior couple of years. The business was faltering because it was small and he was the really the lead sales guy. And the, the only thing, I, I couldn't learn the business from him because I didn't come to work to him until after he was dead. So the only thing that he left us was cash, which, which allowed me the time to learn the business. So had we not, I mean, the legacy he left us was probably as important as it had I, you know, grown up through the business with him, is it gave us the time to figure it out, you know, and and uh, and that was one of the things we were able to do all throughout our career. There was keep money in the bank, which it it addresses a lot of wrongs. It, it really does. Yeah, and cash, you know, if you have the cash, and I think it may mention it before, you can you can last a long time 
you run out of, you know, until you run out of cash. I mean, even I, I know a lot of small business owners, myself included, who took the SBA loans to help through through the COVID piece. And, you know, it's it's a nice cushion to have if you think there's going to be a lean period. In <clears throat> okay. Anybody else have any additional questions here from uh, uh, our a presenter. It's just been really, really interesting and a good reminder to us as as business owners. Like, you know, that that thing about taking a day, a month to like not only run your business, but to run your business, learn your business, remind yourself why you're in business. Look at these numbers, look at these details. And it's tough. It's tough. You want you you want to take a nap. You, you want, you're tired of working at your business. You know, Jerry Luco has a cat. She walks the cat. I mean, whatever it is. And, and I mean, it sounds funny, but sometimes you, you just want to take a break, but unfortunately your business does not take a break. It doesn't. And when you have to, and the worst thing in the world is to have to chase money. Oh my God, to chase money. But I, you know, I have developed over a period of time, uh, and we've talked about this at CBN. You got to ask for your money. You, I am now deadly about my money. We don't negotiate. No, I need Mr. Rand needs his money. So it's very, very interesting to hear a person who has a professional uh, viewpoint of looking at the details of business and saying one of the things is you you got to ask for that dang money, and don't be mm -hmm. afraid of that. So you know, it's just overall, it's just really, really great. And this is just a good reminder to the rest of us. If you're going to be in business, you got to be about business. Rhoda? Yeah, I just want to say that I started, and it's been just the last two years, that we will not start the job until we have 50% down. If it's a, a big project, in other words, if we're talking about uh, we'll write one month worth of blogs and then you'll pay us at the end of the month, that's one thing. But if we're talking about a bigger job, then we don't start the work until we have 50% down. So I, I learned that the hard way. So mm -hmm. We all learn the hard way. Trust yeah. me. <laughs> we, we all learn the hard way. Hey, Lynn, thank you so much. Sorry about your technical issues there, I, buddy. But I think we all got me. something out of this. So, uh, and I, I, th I think it was just a great on point presentation. So with that, you guys, I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day, everybody, again. Bye. Really appreciate it.